Um, so the title of the panel session is Learning from the Past and Looking to the Future. And I've got the sharpest minds in the sector gathered here today. And in case you don't know who they are, if you probably should have been paying attention. You'd have seen all of these faces during the course of the conference. But I've crudely characterized them um, and also characterized myself. See if you can spot which one I am. So I'm the ghost of web past. Um, Claire is the youth of today because our um, young person has to go early because of the Scott Rail train strike. But Claire, has got, she's got the mind of the young people covered. She keeps her smartphone in a sock. Um, and I think that's something the kids do, TBH. Um, the hostess with the most test. Who could that be? Manly, of course. And the sectoral thought leader is Rem from President. And finally, the acceptable face <laughs> of ever encroaching global capitalism. And if you're not using his CMS, he will stalk you unto the ends of the earth. So I was at the WordPress breakout thing and I bumped into Piero afterwards and he said, what session were you in? And I said, the WordPress one. He goes, oh God, you know, this, uh, their servers are all over the place. I was like, leave it alone, man. <laughs> so. Uh, without further ado, I've uh, cooked up some themes which I've rather gimmickly uh, entitled all with P. These are the themes I've seen emerging from the conference, so um, feel free to tweak them and make me feel pleased with myself. Um, so people, um, process, publishing, proof, that was a bit awkward that P one, that. Um, partnership, I've heard a lot about that, working with agencies, working with customers. And unfortunately, penury, um, because um, there's lots of restructuring going on in the sector, redundancy even, um, people having to reapply for their own jobs, and in some cases, the death of some agencies. So I would like you to filter those thoughts through your head in 30 seconds as I move on to my first cooked up back of a fag packet question, which is, is there a future for the university website as we know it? And I'm handing over to you, Claire, the young person, first. Oh, blimey. Can I just say yes or no? No. Um, is there a future? Probably not. Um, I remember when I got my job as web manager um, back in 2008. At my job interview, I said, I probably shouldn't have this job in five years. <laughs> the irony. Um, well, probably I should have said don't, I should. Don't remind them of that. Yes. I hope they're not watching. Um, because even at that time I was thinking that the shape of web and web teams and web managers was changing and it has and I think probably everybody in the room is probably doing something very very different to what they were then and probably their website is very 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 different to what it was then and I think um, certainly ours is very much about lead generation now it's a lot more commercially focused it's a lot more about getting people into the hopper shall we say um, so it is changing. I think we still do need university websites, and they're incredibly important. There is still a role for print, especially in terms of CRM, but not quite the same. So I would say there is a future for the university website, but probably not as we know it. Thanks. Thanks, Claire. Just recap so, the presentation, Pierre. Yeah. Just, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I would completely agree. I think that uh, anyone who has the same website now in even three years' time, I think... Uh, potentially you're in a bit of trouble, you know, it's, um, but I think this is the challenge with a lot of uh, big projects, you know, the big bang sort of like, oh, we've been given a you know, couple of hundred grand sometimes and it's like, we have to do a lot of work for about 18 months, two years, and then that sort of funding dries up. I think with a lot of this, it's putting in place the structure and the funding for projects that allows for continuous improvement, not just big jumps every five years or when an embarrassing moment happens and goes, you know, the crisis. It's really about putting that structure in place so that you can keep up, keep innovating, uh, and being, you know, I, I, I don't like using the word, and a lot of people don't like sales focused, but it is a lot about tracking conversion, tracking a lot of that sort of stuff. So I think a lot of this is about putting the right structure in place to be able to fund this continual change and continual improvement. Thank you. Um, I'll be controversial and say that we went from 12,000 pages down to 1,000 last year. Uh, my aim would be to get down to about 250, if we possibly could. I think um, we replicate a lot of stuff that's already out there. All of our undergrads come through UCAS, so we have a lot of content on our, on our 
website that, that causes us problems because it's there. Um, I would like to see uh, you know, a much more slimmed down, signposted uh, view of a website, but all, not only a website, a, a, a collaboration of all of our underlying systems that give our users the best experience and get them to where they need to be. So um, a website, not as we know it. Not as we know it. I think um, we're looking really at personalization, which is all about you know, T4 and things. Um, but I think um, it's about the, the digital campus. It's about having one website that services everyone, everyone individually, and the content is kind of king uh, or queen. And um, it's about personalizing everything so that an individual goes to the site and um, from when they're thinking about using a university, going to a university, and becoming a, a member of the university and throughout their life cycle um, from being a, um, a, once they leave to ongoing and having the opportunity to, to sell um, throughout, um, whether it's courses or coming back or people giving money afterwards, it's um, about offering a personal experience for every, um, every user throughout their time on the site. Thank you. Um, I actually, this question was prompted by a conversation I had with Harry from Strathclyde. Harry is still here, obviously not scared of the Scott Rail strike, <laughs> or perhaps he's out in solidarity with them. Good for you. Um, and Harry was saying to me in the way into the building at the very start of the conference, we didn't need a, excuse, pardon me while I paraphrase your voice, you know, we didn't need a, a website at all. People will use Google now and Cortona. So in Harry's view, there'll be no websites whatsoever. Is that right? Reflecting your views correctly, Harry? Yeah, I'm sorry about the rubbish accent. I can usually do better. Right, um, question two. Do we, <laughs> this one for you, Piero. Uh, do you still need a CMS? Uh, people may remember, the, the longer and tooth people who have been coming to this conference, that in Bath in about 2004, six, even, we had a big debate about do you actually need a CMS? And I was speaking again CMSs. And I looked up my slides the other day and I thought, my God, everything I said was right. Because <laughs> what I was saying was all the things that have been coming across in this conference, which is CMS is all very well, but you need governance, you need people, you need uh, structure, and all that good stuff. So uh, with that in mind, with the, the idea of my brilliance in mind, can I pass back to you, Remini, and confirm yes. everything I've said? Please. I'd love to say no, just <laughs> to get Pierre's reaction. Um, yes, we do. I think, I think the answer is, you know, as long as we've got content to add and give people... Um, Yes, we need a CMS, but it's not just a matter of putting content up there. It's about integrating well with your back-end systems, from your CRM to, your, um, to the library, to your finances, to whatever it may be. And again, offering a personalized experience for your users. Um, and I think that's key, is making sure you um, have good integration and personalization. Um, I'd say no. I think a CMS is, a <laughs> it is, is quite an old term now. I think one of the things that we invested in recently was, was Sitecore, which sells itself as a customer experience platform. It isn't just about the content, it's about the context. Uh, again, you bring in the segmentation and personalization elements to it, but it's how it links into everything else. So we, we need tools and we need systems to allow us to be relevant and timely and accurate and all of those things, but we should have those anyway. Um, so I would say, it, it, again, not as we know it. I don't know, I've been really on the fence on this one. <laughs> Um, it's 2006 again, Piero. I know, You're staring I still, at me I, still, I can actually remember exactly where that was. I still, I still have these flashbacks. Um, look, you know, I think, I think, no, I agree. I think it's, it's a lot more, but I think the base is you need to have your content managed in a way, and, you know, well, not necessarily our system, but some way of managing it in a way. But I think the key thing I, I would say is that it's really important when you're looking at whether content management or digital experience management systems, or whatever the new term, and they sort of change every three years or so, is ultimately you need to find a system that really fits in with your team. So I think that's, so it's what is the right CMS for your type of team? Because I would say is, forgetting about who I work for, um, I would definitely say is when you're looking at things, look at your team, like do you have a big set of developers? Can you do a lot of work in-house? Is it one that you need something more out of the box? 
But I would say is by making the right choice there, then it will enable you and it will act as a catalyst to do things that you want to do faster. So that once you get you, know, you get your content in good shape, it will help you and it will be a catalyst to put in things like better governance and stuff like that. But I would say the one thing I would say is when you're looking at systems or whatever, is look at the resources you have in-house and what is the system that best fits in with that and whether that's content management or whether that's digital marketing tools or you know, social media management, that is absolutely critical because you can end up getting a CMS using the older term that probably you know, is being replaced uh, uh, um, very recently and with other things, but it's, if, you, if you pick the wrong type of one, it will actually, you might as well not have one. If, like, if you don't have the resources to back it up, you know, if you're custom building something but you don't have developers, more than one developer to look after it, then I'd say you're, you're in a very risky position. So in that case, I'd say it's about picking the right one and against what resources you have in-house. I think you're all in violent agreement, as we say. Yeah, you know, Claire. That's politically correct answer. <laughs> Um, I think with any system, it's only ever going to be as good as how you deploy it. So I think it very much depends on the resource that you've got in-house and what your strategy is at that time. And I think it is worth reviewing if you do have a CMS, whether you still need it or whether you need to change it or integrate it differently with what you've got. When we, we, are, we are Terminal 4, well, I'm not Terminal 4, we have Terminal 4. Uh, and when we got it, even at the time, we said it, it isn't to solve everything. It is to solve our general users' problems to be able to publish and moderate content at that time. We still have a developer who does all the fancy stuff. Not everything lives in the content management system. We have a database that runs our courses. Everyone will be the same. You know, you, you, you need to have the systems and platforms and governance to run what you need to do at that time. And I think the editorial role is incredibly important. There's no point just having a CMS that loads of people feed with loads of content if you've not got an overall editorial person looking at that on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, if you attach the journalism model to a CMS, I think that that makes it work. But I agree that it's got to either fit in with the other systems that you've got or actually, you know, be able to fulfill your university strategy at that time. And that, that, that sometimes you do need to take a step back and say, you know, is this still doing what we need it to do? So I think it's about that constant reflection all the time. But certainly for us, yes, now. Thank you. Antifa. Question three. Is Agile a universal panacea? Claire, you've got the mic. Oh, uh, th this, this kind of goes back to, is a web strategy a silver bullet? Web strategy. For anyone who's been along uh, as long as I have. Um, uh, oh, gosh. No, I don't think. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Agile over the last few conferences, and I was in a really good session with um, the president yesterday where we talked about Agile again and seeing all the examples that have come up over the last three days. We don't use Agile... Um, What's the word? Officially, as it were. Agilely. But, agilely. But we do, we just call it getting on with it. Um, and we just sort of do, <laughs> we, I know, so, just get on. so we do iterative developments all the time. It's very, very rare at Bradford that we'll do a big bang. Um, I don't think they work. Um, we, we do tend to develop all the time. But I, I do think, having reflected on what everybody else has, has shown with Agile as a, you know, a proper set of rules and systems to use, I do think we're going to at least go back and give it a pilot for a month or on a couple of certain projects, because we do have a lot of projects on the go at any one time, probably upwards of 20 to 30 at some points, and a lot of it is in my brain, which probably isn't very good if I ever needed to report on anything. So good I think brain, in terms of, it's, well, thanks, thanks. Um, so I think in terms of it being a universal panacea, possibly not, but I think it's a good set of governance rules and processes to adopt and see what happens in your area. We're going to give it a go anyway. Um, I, I, think, I, I, think, I think, Claire, you're right on that one. I think the big thing you should try and make sure is you have the right processes. And there's a lot of this links in with Garrett's um, presentation at, uh, um, yesterday. Is you definitely, to, to even get involved in Agile, I think you really have to make sure your day-to-day -day bug fixing and activities are separate from project work. I think potentially Agile or a flavor of it uh, and I think a flavour of it is probably the right way to describe it. I think because you have to adapt it to how your team work. And I, I've never really seen what I would call like purest agile work in. Like you sort of have to adapt it and sort of find how it would fit in with your own organisation. I think it can work around projects. The one I think where many of you 
um, can sometimes have challenges when also working with external organisations. And uh, I'm not sure if, if you've seen this before as well. It's like where sometimes, say, a university wants to work in an agile way, but a lot of the, the purchasing processes around engaging with an agency aren't built or designed to even for you to do that. So if you go to purchasing and say, we want to engage an agency to help us with development, we're going to work in an agile way, they're going to say, well, OK, what's the deliverable and what's the, the cost? And unfortunately, you can fix the cost, as we were talking about last night, but it's, it's sort of obviously agile is agile. So unless you have agile purchasing and agile invoicing, it's very hard for you to do it with an external supplier. Um, so I think there's definitely places where it works. It's, it's not panacea at all, uh, but it's definitely some of the tools and Kanban and um, Scrum and so on. There's parts of it you can really use as tools like any other tools and, and apply them, use them as part of your team's arsenal of approaches. Um, I think, it, you know, Agile with a capital A is just a, a method. We might as well be talking about Prince2 or any of the other things that, that come along. Um, and we are using it at John Moores for projects and for, for BAU stuff as well. The problems that we've had introducing that is that the rest of the university doesn't want to work in that manner. So it's how then we have a negotiation around how we want to work and how they want to work. The external partners are, are much easier because you can tell them how you want to work and generally that fits in with the, their ethos anyway. Um, it's, it's definitely not a, a panacea. I think you have to look at uh, whatever scenario you're working on and whoever you're working with and adjust it to that method um, to get the best outcome really. Um, but it's, uh, it's good, I think, for teams to see how other people are working. We've done quite a lot of work around the, the Google Sprint, um, Google Ventures methodologies about how getting seven people in a room for three days can really move something forward. That's been really interesting to do. It's not something we're going to do every day of the week, but actually doing it once a month to move things on quickly and to build that culture in the organisation is really useful. It's, it's a lovely idea, um, but it's, um, and it's definitely the most creative way of working and it's a way we like to work and we do work. However, you have to have some barriers because as Piero was saying, you know, um, the finance departments want to know how much you're spending. And so, you know, we have to work within budgets and, you know, have, be as agile as possible, but within a certain amount of boundaries and, and mix it up a bit. You know, there is a bit of Prince 2 in there, you know, you have to have a certain amount of different ways of working and, um, you know, the, the agile way, if you could, in a dream world, have, be purely agile and have purely agile budgets, <laughs> that would be amazing. So if anyone wants to, do let me know. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, uh, a great way of working. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be brave now and open up the uh, floor to questions. And I think Brian is in the roving mic and he would like Marika to help him if she's still around. God damn her, she's escaped again. So Brian, it's all on you, mate. Uh, so can we have a question for the panel? Please, it's your last chance to draw upon these very expert people. I've still got some bribes in that box over there, by the way. There you go. Ah, can you say your name and your institution? Thank you. Uh, it's Graham Bird from Cardiff University. Um, I'd like to know from Mandy, uh, what you mentioned about Sitecore, are you planning on having dedicated staff to look after the customer experience angle of the website? Um, I'm writing a proposal as we speak to kind of reframe our department from a, a change department to a strategic, a strategic user experience department. And that's not just student, that's staff and researcher and every other segment as well. Um, the way we approach it currently is that my 20 staff are all absolutely focused on the user experience and what we've got a lot of is other staff around the university who have customer experience or student experience in their roles but what I find is that's kind of lip service because if they're not directly contributing to that experience then how can you be measured in your role as doing that so I think I'm tra trying to take um, almost a design thinking approach to the user experience how we adjust what we're doing a little bit, because we're already doing a lot of the user stories, a lot of the customer journey mapping, all of that stuff, but to link it to an experience strategy to take it forward. 
And I think one of the key things here is, and it's interesting, a lot of teams are trying to find their, their feet as to where they are in the organization. Maybe actually that's a theme that goes back to my first IWMW in 2005, um, like where do we sit? But I think one of the challenges is I, I think that's, it's really good to, to put a lot of effort into a really solid user experience because that will just pay, pay dividends. I, I think the biggest challenge I see is so many of us here are talking about like student recruitment and yet the student recruitment people are often sitting in very different parts of the organization, analyze often very different data and different KPIs. And I think the user experience and particularly because student recruitment is such a key driver for the university, I really think in part of the sometimes the organizational structure, I really feel that those two areas need to be a lot closer. Because for say making a business case saying, you know, all the benefits of say student experience improving, that's going to improve XYZ retention and all the rest. But also the metrics from student recruitment, if you can actually show an improvement there, it makes a really good business case to drive all this cool work because you need resources and you need time. You know, digital experience, personalization, you know, whatever um, way you want to call it. It takes time, it takes thinking, it takes data. And I think, I think universities, there needs to be more joining up between student recruitment and student experience and digital, um, way more than there is now. Um, like just a small note, like I, I go to like tons of conferences every year, like all across higher ed stuff. And when I go to student recruitment conferences, you know, the, there's the, all the, say the challenges you guys sometimes have about getting budget to come to say IWMW, I've seen like people send people around the world to go to like CRM conferences in student recruitment. It's just that there's something wrong that like that that the people in student recruitment and people in digital and say user experience it's not more joined up. It's just it's a bit shocking now. Oh, yeah, sure. Just to add to that, I think you know student recruitment is really important, but it's not the be all and end all. If we recruit six thousand students, um, marketing are interested until we get them to registration. What I'm interested in is not just that period of getting the bums on a seat, but it's actually their experience in year one, year two, year three before they complete NSS, and the alumni experience as well. Because retention, you know, is a big issue for us, as I'm sure it is for everybody else. So it's not, you know, it's trying to get out of that siloed approach of saying, have we got them? Great, we can forget about them now and go and get some more. It's about saying they're here now. We really want to look at that experience of how they travel around campus, of what the accommodation is like. It touches every part of the university. And of course, if you don't, you'll have Marika on your back. From not, you'll have Marika on your back, I said, if you don't sort those things out for them as well. Well, well you know, most highly commended, and that, I have to say, Oh, Sorry. look at the poster. Well, don't start me in a rant. Most highly commended university for QAA. But to me, great doesn't mean anything for the student experience. So let's not even go there. Um, the question is really about uh, Marika's talk. Pulling on from that, really. Um, and I don't know how to ask it. Uh, CMA, how does it affect you guys in practice? Uh, and how do you think that the university that you represent or the organisation you represent um, might respond to it? It's massive. It's scary and it's big and it's massive. And I think probably most institutions by now, if, you, if, you, if you're not sure about what your institution is doing, probably find out. It will probably have a home. It might sit in your planning department or if you've got something similar to like that. Because it does cross the entire university. It's about, it's about student contracts. It's about the student um, offer letter. It's about what you say on your website. It's about what you say at an open date. It's about what stats you use. It, it, it is huge and everybody absolutely needs to get their head around it. Um, I look after the website, uh, the web team and the print team. So we do all the print publications for the institution as well as the web stuff. Um, there's six of us. <laughs> um, and, we, you know, it's been at, it's literally at the, back of, well, it's not at the back of our minds, it's at the forefront of our minds all day, every day. Um, it only takes one student to say, oh, well, you said that, and actually that's not true, and you're stuffed, to be honest. So it, it, what you probably need to do is, within your institution, find out who is taking a lead on it. Um, uh, for us, it is um, the deputy director of planning or the director of planning, something like that. 
um, and there is a group looking at it, um, and it is about the internal communications within your organisation about the CMA, about reading the guidance, about working out who is responsible for what. So I think a lot of the time within an institution, people aren't quite sure who is responsible for something. Like, do you know in your institution, where does the book stop for course information? So if the course information is wrong on the website, why is it wrong? Is it the web team's fault? Is it the academic's fault? Is it, you know, this whole trail, it, you know, we could be here all day, but it, it, it is massive. Yeah. Could I just abuse my position as chair and interject and say a um, positive thing about it? Uh, we're, we've, we're just embroiled in a two-year project to redo our prospectus, and we found that um, we were sort of automatically pulling in module content for degree programs, and of course a lot of these were, were quite poor, and the CMA thing has been a helpful lever to get people to finally sort that out because we were just hitting a brick wall in the past. So although it's um, onerous and it's, uh, it'll expose all the bonkers processes in your institutions, it can actually be used to your advantage as well. Yeah, I think that that's really, like using, it's finding these catalysts, you know, I think in change management they call, call them the burning platforms or the crises or it's like a great way to, to sort of focus on you know, being able to, because I, I think like, having really good quality course content is just really important and really accurate. I, I think the biggest challenge, and, and there's a webinar we have, we ran on this, which is on our website, so you can check it out. Um, but it's, I think the biggest challenge around all this is also finding your single, so, uh, single points of truth. Because like we, we work with so many universities where a course description in the prospectus can be inconsistent with what's on the website, which is inconsistent to maybe on a microsite. And then you have people talking about the courses and academics talking about it. And it's really, first of all, deciding what is actually going to be the, the source of truth for particular, say, descriptions or module descriptions and so on. You know, is it going to be your, your student information system? Is it going to be your curriculum management system, which could be a separate solution? Is it in some cases, the PDF that you have to scrape out of. You know, you can, you know, people are at all different levels. But I think that's one of the biggest challenges. And then really making sure you're mapping out with, uh, I would call, like risk and uh, curriculum management people in your university. What is the, what is the path for, for changing these things? That it's not just like, I'm going to go in and modify something on a course that says something, and then it's not going through the right workflows. So I think it's having, Having something like this is a really good catalyst to focus a spotlight on something that really ultimately impacts student experience. Because, I, yes, there are lots of things that need to be solved from the journey from, from prospective student right through to alumni and, and so on. But I think you sort of have to start somewhere. And for me, if you get good quality course descriptions that are engaging, written well, accurate, and setting the right expectations, that will also help with retention because you're setting the right expectations. You're not, you're not sending people saying, oh, this is on our central campus, when really that degree is actually taught in, in another campus like you know, 45 minutes away you know, and they have bad experiences. So I, I think it's just it's a really good catalyst to get people focused on what's going to be really good for student experience anyway. I think I try and approach um, our, our whole business as, you know, courses are, are products. And those products start in planning about three years before they actually start getting delivered, as you all know. Uh, and we have an academic uh, planning process, um, which academics write these validation documents that have, don't go anywhere near marketing, don't go any, anywhere near the website. And this is one of the difficulties for us in having a single source of truth, is that you get Professor A writing this, who then actually leaves after six months, and another professor takes over and rewrites that. And then by the time it gets to the website, it's written for a research audience for his particular subject. And what we need to do is spin that to say, how can we make this approachable for the general masses who want to come and look at this course? So there's all those iterations, which is really about personalising that content for those different, different audiences. Audiences. I think my concern with the CMA, certainly at LJMU, is we don't have a central place for it. It's, um, you know, it's kind of being picked up as risk and it's being picked up by the senior team who then jump all up and down on everyone to try and make things happen. And um, we also, it's, be, it's almost like health and safety, you know, when you're at a meeting and people go, oh, can't do that because of health and safety. Well, now we're getting the same with the CMA. All right, I'll shout Spike. Just staying with that. Um, you know, everything was said about um, single sources of the truth. We, we've got the same problem. I think everyone does. Um, but what I 
I've noticed occasionally is there's been quite a strange reaction uh, with the whole having to have everything ready five years in advance. And you know, the iPads will be care of the computer and then talk about iPads and that kind of thing. And there seems to be this this way of thinking that's appeared in parts of our place where they think, well they'll just be very vague. So the module will be called business. You will learn about business. <laughs> as like, right, okay, so we're not act we're, we're kind of going back, like right? not telling them anything under the assumption that um, if we're big enough, we can, we can claim it's always right. I'm just wondering how, whether you think that will actually just come back to bite us and whether anyone else is having exactly the same issue. We've had a very similar experience. We went from having module information on the website to an edict to take all the modules off and have themes, partly because we were getting QA aid, but partly because of the CMA as well. Uh, and now we're going back through not having themes to having module information again, because guess what? The users want module information. That's what they want. Um, and I think what we're struggling with right now is not focusing on the user experience is having crazy requests from all part of the business who think we need to comply with these bits without anyone having a full understanding of what it is and I think until somebody gets taken to court for it we won't find out exactly what that is. Bring on the lawsuits. <laughs> There's one there. That one. Just one quick thing to add to, the, to, add to that is that CMA doesn't say you can't change stuff, you can. You just need to tell people that you've changed it. So if your modules for 2016 are different to 2017 to 2018, that's a good thing. They should be. You just need to make sure that, say, somebody does apply for 2016 coming up and something does change, that you let them know in good enough time for them to make a decision as to whether they want to then change their decision. So it is big and scary, but it isn't saying you can't change anything. You just need to make sure that people know. Okay, um, I'm going to kill it there so Brian can make some closing remarks and we can all get off to our trains, planes and automobiles in a hurry. Um, can I just uh, thank the panel individually, Claire for keeping our phone in a sock, <laughs> Piero for being such a good egg and being the butt of so many of my jokes, Mandy for her beautiful building, wonderful hostessing and all the rest has made this such a great conference, and Rem, thank you for your agency and all the uh, me calling you an abusive partner. That's very kind of you. So thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>